an opportunity to be able to uh, speak a little bit about refugees. John was working in the university lab outside of Kinshasa, Congo, when rebels invaded the complex, and hiding under a lab desk while many of his fellow students were being shot and butchered. It became evidently clear to him that he would need to leave the country with his family or be killed. Not all of his family members could leave. His aging parents were in no condition to do so. John made his way to Zambia across the border with his two nine-year-old brothers. He applied as a refugee for relocation and eventually John, without his brothers, was accepted as a refugee in the USA and relocated from tropical Africa to frozen Chicago. Having found refuge, John prayed his two young brothers might someday be safe as well. I know John's story because our church at the time, the Hillside Free Methodist Church in Chicago, was helping relocate him and get him established in the USA, along with hundreds of other refugees. Jesus was also a refugee. Joseph and Mary smuggled their firstborn out of Bethlehem under the cover of night when they learned of their status as political threats. King Herod heard of a possible threat to his throne, had been born, and ordered the massacre of all boys under the age of two. Joseph and Mary escaped political violence by becoming refugees in Egypt. No country, no home, no safety, no language or cultural connections. Refugee Jesus relied upon the mercy of Egyptians, former oppressors and no friend to Israel, for shelter and food until they could return safely home. The United Nations defines a refugee as someone who's been forced to flee his or her country because of persecution, war, or violence. Refugees have a reasonable fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group, and they cannot return home or understandably afraid to do so for the consequences they would face. War and ethnic, tribal, and religious violence are the leading cause of refugees fleeing their countries, of which there are 30 million in the world right now. Unlike migrants who choose to leave, refugees are forced to leave. What is the responsibility of people of faith toward those who have been so displaced? The Bible has much to say, but I'll focus on a poignant passage from Isaiah 16. Isaiah 16 describes refugees fleeing from Moab. The Moabites had been enemies of Israel, had oppressed Israel for decades, a frequent source of both military and political conflict and irritation. The Israelites had no love for Moabites, nor Moabites for them. For national security reasons, Moabites were not welcome in Israel. But verse 6 reveals the attitude of Israel toward Moab when it says, we've heard of Moab's pride, her overweening pride and conceit, her pride and her insolence, her boasts are empty. And now the Moabites wail. They wail together for Moab. In other words, arrogant Moab deserves to suffer. That's the attitude. But this does not reveal God's attitude. God and Isaiah together lament and weep over the Moabite losses as the small nation is invaded and crops are destroyed and men are slaughtered and Families are forced to flee. Verses 7 through 12, which are many verses, I'm condensing to a few, lament and grieve for the men, for the fields, for the rulers of the nations have trampled down their choicest vines. And so I, this is God speaking, so I weep as you weep, Moab, and I drench you with tears. Isaiah had prophesied the downfall of Moab and its misery, but its destruction was not to be a cause of celebration. The death and destruction of people, enemies of the state, though they were, is a source of sorrow and pain. So here's how Isaiah describes the Moabite refugees, verses 1 and 2. 
They come from across the desert to the mount of the daughter of Zion, like fluttering birds pushed from the nest. So are the women of Moab at the fords of Arnon. I just want you to see and hear the picture painted by the prophet here. There's refugees, mostly women and children, because the men have been slaughtered, and they're fleeing their once safe and prosperous homes to cross a vast desert with the hope of arriving at the border of Israel for safety. And in order to get to the border of Israel, these refugees had to cross not only this arid desert and wasteland, but also the fords of Arnon. Sounds like something from Gain of Thrones, but it's a river that formed the national border. And Arnon is known even today as the Grand Canyon of Jordan. It was terrifying, dangerous, and deadly. The only reason such a vast and inhospitable journey was ever attempted, a journey along which many died, was the hope of refuge away from certain death and famine that awaited these victims of war. Sound familiar? I mean, this was written 3,000 years ago, but it could be today's news, not just for those fleeing violence from Central America to seek shelter in Mexico or the United States, but for 30 million homeless, nationless, traumatized human beings around the world. God describes these refugees, and I quote, as fluttering birds pushed from the nest. God brought this passage home to me the first time I read it, nearly 30 years ago. When that very same day I read it, I left my apartment and I found two baby birds sprawled, kicking pathetically on the sidewalk beneath the nest from which they had been prematurely thrust. I couldn't save the birds. They were too far gone and my heart broke. God says refugees like those birds, they had a nest. They were making plans and preparing for a life, minding their own business, hoping to fly to freedom, and then war and violence pushed them before they could fly from the nest and onto the ground to die with no way, no strength, no possibility to seek their own shelter, their own food, their own life. Refugees in God's eyes are like fluttering birds pushed from the nest, completely at the mercy of those who might encounter. The Word of God instructs the people of God what to do when they see refugees, and it isn't judgment or self-protective fear. Instead, God calls Israel, regarding even their enemies who are now refugees, to do this in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 16. Hide the refugees. Do not betray them. Let the Moabite fugitives stay with you. Be their shelter from the destroyer. The word of God. Hide refugees, shelter them, let them stay with you. And whatever you do, people of faith, do not betray refugees. As free Methodists, we take scripture seriously. And we don't look to our political leaders for cues regarding our attitude and action toward the least of these, toward refugees. We look to God, and consequently, our book of discipline, grounded in the Word of God, makes it plain what our duty as free Methodists is. The discipline says, as we minister to all immigrants and refugees, we do so with basic underlying convictions. One, we commit to the biblical principle of caring for the foreigners among us, regardless of racial or ethnic background, country of origin, or legal status. Two, we commit to acting redemptively with love rather than fear and to reach out to meet needs as we see them. Three, we commit to identifying intolerance and working to end it, as well as ending any personal inclinations to refer to individuals in any less than loving terms. And where there is a conflict, it is our duty to oppose all unjust and harsh laws and to seek to change them. And finally, we commit to responding to refugees in terms of the Great Commission, seeking to reach the lost, whoever they may be, ministering to all, caring for all, and showing God's grace to all people. Look, I've wept and I've prayed with hundreds of refugees. 
I've wept with a teen Muslim girl who'd been gang raped by so-called Christian soldiers. With a Liberian son forced to watch his mother's legs broken and his father beaten to death by soldiers before he himself was beaten at gunpoint. I've prayed with two Sudanese men who were kidnapped as children and forced to join an army and to kill their own families or be shot themselves. I've wept with a Croatian mother who gave birth while bombs landed in her living room. I'm friends with the Rwandan husband who lost in a mob crowd his wife and children as they fled a massacre, only to discover them, thanks be to God, but relocated on a different continent and remarried, having believed her husband to have been killed. And I could go on and on. In our church, we've ministered to Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, men, women, and children from Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. The story of refugees is global, as is the love of God. Look, I open this story with, the, with John's story from the Congo and his two young brothers, whom we left in Zambia. Our church was able to safely bring them to Chicago from Zambia. My wife and I are glad to call. Alex and Felix are sons, and they're thriving. God is good. But through no fault of their own, refugees are the neediest people in the world. They seek only a place to live safely and a chance to make a new life. Tens of millions will never be given that chance. Refugees are the least of these, which means if you want to see the eyes of Jesus up close and personal, Look into the eyes of a refugee and remember the call of God upon us as a people of faith. Hide the refugees. Do not betray the refugees. Let the refugees stay with you and be their shelter from the destroyer. So we do have a question. And this is to Benga. So I'm going to ask, and Benga, uh, unmute yourself. And the question is, how would we find immigrants to host or to tutor? Um, you know, it, we, uh, there are colleges, most, I mean, most of the um, institutions here in America have a lot of immigrants. Um, colleges, universities, just, I mean, visit them i don't know if um, if you don't have it in your next neighbor you may have a college that uh, a lot of immigrants are coming to um, that, that is the first place that we i will check and then some if, um, some communities are also being host to uh, refugees that may also be another area where to see immigrants <music>